Good morning. Uh, my name is Lalna Kagal, and I lead the Decentralized Information Group at CSAIL. Thank you for inviting us to talk about some of our projects at this very interesting forum. Uh, so uh, the Decentralized Information Group um, has been doing research for the last maybe 20 years, I think. And uh, we are um, interested, our, our research is motivated by two main challenges. One is we're very interested in ensuring data ownership and making sure that owners retain control of their data. And two, uh, we're interested in aspects of the use and misuse of data. So things like policy compliance, how do you ensure that data is being used according to the policy that it was uh, what's supposed to be used under um, bias? How do you make sure that you can mitigate bias, privacy, that you don't leak sensitive information from the data that you're using, accountability, when something goes wrong, how do you figure out who's responsible and what to do about it? So uh, those, are, those are the kind of axes that that um, frame our research. We've been working uh, in, uh, oops, <laughs> thank you, uh, three, uh, uh, well, a couple of computing paradigms. So of course, we've done a lot of work with the, with the web. So we've developed frameworks like Solid, which is a decentralizing architecture for the web. We've done work for decentralized file storage. Uh, policy compliance across um, distributed sources, things like that. We've done work for uh, databases and blockchain. How do you do accountability using the blockchain? Um, how do you do? How do you make sure that um, usage control policies are applied when you're kind of trying to do analysis across distributed databases and things like that? And what we're currently looking into is this this computing paradigm that we call AI. So ma mainly machine learning. And uh, with machine learning, uh, we found that in order to get high quality, robust, generalizable models, we need a lot of data. And where does this data come from? It comes from distributed sources. So how do you kind of combine that data in a way that is privacy preserving, that meets policies, that, um, that, does, not, that, uh, that, that does not have too much bias in it, so those are the kind of uh, questions we're trying to address. And we have two presentations today. The first presentation is around uh, doing a, a distributed question answering system for clinical data. So you have a bunch of uh, hospitals, research labs, universities that are collaborating and you want to have natural language uh, questions across those organizations. How do you do that? with all these parameters in mind, you know, privacy, bias, accountability, stuff like that. And the other project is around doing uh, learning across embedded devices. So if you're trying to monitor uh, your manufacturing process or you're um, monitoring some kind of labs or even aging in place, you want to constantly collect data, but you want to make sure that you're doing it Again, with all these things in place, privacy, policy, accountability. So how do you, how do, you do that? So those, uh, those are the two projects that we're going to talk about today. We have a whole bunch of other projects, but we don't have time for that. So feel free to reach out if you have uh, questions. We've left time for questions right now. We're also in the design phase of both these projects. So we're looking forward to your feedback if you have if you have alternate suggestions for the design, that would be great too. So we're looking forward to chatting. And uh, with that, I'd like to, to welcome Emily and Alice. All right, cool. Okay, good morning. Thank you so much for having us and for giving us the opportunity to share what we've been working on. I'm Emily and Alice and I are both MN students in DIG. Uh, our research focuses on Federation healthcare and specifically as Lalana introduced, we're working on a system that will allow medical professionals to ask natural language questions about the health data of their patients. Uh, to do this, we're using a relatively new promising technique in LLM engineering called retrieval augmented generation. And we'll talk a little bit about why we think RAG has so much potential for this use case. Uh, so yeah, uh, to, before we start, I just wanna preface again that we're only a month or so into this project. so. Uh, we're just going to be sharing like our background, motivations, and design, but of course, there's lots of room for change, so we'd appreciate any feedback or suggestions, comments, anything. Uh, okay. Um, 
Yeah, so the main motivation behind all of this is that LLMs have revolutionized the way that people interact with data. So you don't even have to qualify a statement like this nowadays, thanks to services like ChatGPT and the widespread popularity of them. But what fundamentally LLMs let us do is to extract information from unstructured text and use it to respond to human prompts, like recipe suggestions or how to do your math homework. But in healthcare specifically, one big benefit of LLMs is that having a model that physicians can just interact with like a human is really beneficial in that it breaks down that barrier of needing any technological background to use machine learning models. Clinical data in particular is also a really great fit for uh, language models. So most of the data is locked up in these things called EHRs or electronic health records. And there's some, there's some structured data here. So things in like Excel spreadsheets, for example, things like uh, lab results and prescriptions, but the bulk of EHR data is unstructured. So it's just unannotated freeform text written by a physician, like patient notes and discharge summaries. Uh, and with the recent like wave of LLMs, we've only really just begun to start capitalizing on this wealth of unstructured information. But unique data and, challenge, uh, and uh, risks in the clinical setting make it challenging to just directly apply LLMs here. So, um, sorry, my bad. Uh, patient health data is unique in a lot of ways. It's dynamic. It's changing over time with new doctors' visits and prescriptions and lab results. It's distributed across hospitals and their departments. And it's also heavily protected by privacy laws. So for example, HIPAA prevents you from inputting patient data directly into an LLM that's hosted, such as ChatGPT and a number of its other like online competitors. Um, even if you have a language model that can answer clinical questions, it still probably lacks interpretability. It's a black box. It might say that a patient is at risk for diabetes, but you can't say, you don't know how or why that decision was made. Um, this is a pretty problematic in healthcare because physicians heavily value interpretability in language models. This makes sense, obviously, because they want to be sure that the predictions are actually, that they can be trusted to inform clinical decisions. So recent research has tried to improve upon interpretability by explicitly prompting the LLM to provide evidence with its answer. So you might ask, like, is this patient at risk for diabetes? Why or why not? And hopefully your model would respond with like a citation from the patient's EHR. So that's pretty clever, but it's far from foolproof. There's really no guarantee that the citation will be from the patient's EHR at all, or more broadly, that anything that the model says is true. So this is reflective of a typical problem with LLMs in that they occasionally hallucinate information. Obviously that's especially dangerous in healthcare because if you have a model that's being used to inform decisions like treatments or diagnoses or to summarize a patient's medical history, uh, you really want that to be accurate. So <laughs> given all these challenges and more, how can we adapt natural language querying for healthcare? So we think that this technique called retrieval augmented generation or RAG can alleviate much of these concerns actually. So RAG was introduced by Facebook AI in 2020 and it's a framework for improving the quality of LLM generated responses by including documents at query time to supplement what the model already knows internally. So the general analogy here is that RAG is sort of like taking an open book exam. So, um, when the user asks a question, the model has the opportunity to first perform a search over an external knowledge source to be more certain in like the validity of its answers. So RAG combines a retriever and a generator portion. So the retriever has all these documents from the external knowledge source. Uh, this could be like all the articles on Wikipedia, or it could be something more domain specific, like medical, like a medical textbook or patient health records. And so the retriever has all of these documents from the external source in this embedded as vectors in some latent space. And when the user asks the question, the retriever will, in, will encode that query into the same space as all the other documents and use that representation to see which like top K documents are most relevant to the user's question. So this is kind of like a nearest neighbor search in a vector database. Um, then once you have those K documents, the retriever will send those over to the generator phase and the generator will take the user's original query and produce the best response conditioned on the information in those retrieved documents. Mm -hmm. So the probability is like affected by those documents, which is why the answer is able to like hinge upon those. 
So we think RAG is the key to adapting LLMs for clinical applications. So that external knowledge source that I was just talking about, that can be anything, right? It can be new medical research articles. It can be new patient records. And what this gives us is domain adaptation and knowledge update all without fine tuning. So this is actually very important. If you compare this to something like ChatGPT, if you try to ask it, uh, like, what is the prime minister of Morocco? You'll get a message back about how the model has limited information past September, 2021. So in order for ChatGPT to be able to incorporate new information uh, without using something like RAG, it would have to be fine-tuned again over all the news that's occurred since its knowledge cutoff date. And obviously for really big models, that's very expensive and uh, like wasteful. And with RAG uh, or with domain adaptation, uh, Clinical ML has often produced or fine-tuned their own version of popular general models that are adapted to the many like idiosyncrasies of medical text. Um, but with RAG, we have the clinical context embedded at, or not embedded, uh, provided at query time uh, that the model hasn't seen during training, which means that we're able to use a general purpose, state-of-the-art LLM, as long as it's HIPAA compliant. So RAG also improves interpretability, which means it's more physician friendly. Uh, we have an idea of which documents were used to, were, were retrieved to produce a response to each query. And not only that, but we also have an idea of which documents ended up being, uh, ended up producing the most uh, helpful responses. So with that, we have some idea of like explainability and interpretability. Uh, and this also makes hallucinations easier to catch and less likely in the first place. Finally, RAG is, allows for pretty modular design between this retriever and generator component. Uh, this allows us, to, allows us to design our own custom scheme for keeping patient data secure and access controlled while still using an out-of-the-box LLM so we don't have to reinvent the wheel on that front. So this segues us pretty nicely into our, the central question of our research, which I'll turn to the side so I can read. Can we enable medical professionals to query trends across patient data in a decentralized and privacy preserving way? So what separates this from past efforts is its scope. We want to enable querying of not just a single patient's EHR data, but rather to infer trends across patient data in a system. So some examples of what those questions might look like are of MIT students age 18 to 25 with major depression. Oh, medicated with Lexapro. What are the treatment outcomes after six months? Or a patient is exhibiting the following symptoms. How many other patients at this practice have exhibited similar symptoms in the past five years? What has been the most common diagnosis? So these questions are tough to answer for all the reasons that we just discussed. Patient data is in all different places and we want to keep it secure. So for example, we might not want a doctor to be able to access the records of patients that aren't under their care. And to do this, the retriever component of RAG needs to be able to not only see what data is necessary to answer a certain question, but also what data is accessible to the person that's asking. So Alice is gonna talk a little bit about how we plan to do that. So to recap, Clinical EHR data is distributed, dynamic, because patient data is constantly evolving and it must be kept secure. So these are the three main dimensions we're paying attention to when developing our model. And if we think about existing RAG models, they usually use just one document retriever whose output will be passed as context along with the prompt into the LLM generator in the final step. However, this is mainly because most models just use Wikipedia or some other general uniform vector database, such as like PubMed, as a singular knowledge source. However, there is no singular database of patient EHR data because that would be a big privacy concern since keeping individual medical data in a centralized location is very insecure. And as a result, we will be modifying RAG to have to keep the generation step mostly the same, but to change the retrieval step into a hierarchy of retrievers. So for the generation step, we plan on using GPD-2 or the instruction fine-tuned FLAN-T5 model, but 
because of the modular na nature of the framework, you can basically drag and drop any generator LLM into that step. And for the retriever step, instead of one document retriever, we will be federating retrievers, uh, retrieval over a hierarchy. So given a prompt, we, will, we might have a retriever per hospital organization that have access control boundaries between them. And within a hospital, we might further fine grainly federate it so that there's a different retriever per hospital department, such as for like the ICU unit, like cardiology, oncology, et cetera. And this is so that, for example, doctors would want to know all of the medical data in, their, in the charts of their patients, but hospital staff might only need to know some administrative, more high-level information. And to perform the authorization for this role-based uh, access control, we are planning on using OAuth as an out-of-the-box framework. Finally, the non-leaf nodes of this hierarchy act more as routers to filter and then kind of recursively propagate the query down. And the actual retrieval logic is done at the leaf nodes, in which we are planning on using clinical BERT embeddings um, and similarity scores to return like the top K most similar documents. And we choose clinical BERT because it's initialized from the BERT based embeddings, but fine tuned on clinical nodes to be more domain specific. Uh, in order to combine our generator LLM step with the hierarchy of retrievers, we're planning on using LinkChain right now because it lends itself straightforwardly to creating this end-to-end -end framework while making like a lot of changes to the retrieval step. So this is a general diagram kind of modified from the previous slides, general rag um, of what we are thinking. So on the left-hand side, you have the chain of the user giving a prompt to the engine and the LLM that's the machine, that, that's the model that's actually generating the response. But on the right-hand side, you have the federated retrieval step that retrieves all of the documents to be used as context. So the first step, the user will enter in the prompt, which is like what Emily said, all of those tr general trends in medical data. And the engine will take the prompt and also the user's OAuth token that they provided and send it over to the retrieval hierarchy. And using that auth token, we will filter out the retrievers that the user is actually able to access. So like if this doctor is only authorized at certain hospitals, then like the third hospital will be filtered out. Yeah, sorry. And then, um, so the leaf nodes will do the retrieval step of actually using the clinical BERT embeddings to retrieve all of the documents, and those documents will be passed back to the engine. And in the initial steps of our project, we're mostly focusing on this security access control and federation, but there is a possibility to do some privacy preservation techniques here too, in order to like do some perturbation of the return documents so that even if the user is allowed, authorized to access the documents, what's returned is still not the raw data. Uh, yeah, and then the documents along with the prompt will be passed to the LLM, just like in normal RAG, and a response will be generated that is returned back to the user. And along with the response, we also want to cite the source documents so that there is better interpretability of the response. And here, there's also potential for more sophisticated interpretability techniques other than just returning the source documents because, for example, we also have the similarity score uh, magnitude for each document and you can probably infer some kind of more detailed uh, logical relationship between each document and the response. Finally, we are trying to evaluate our federated RAG model on these axes of federation and security. If existing uh, clinical healthcare specific LLMs are usually evaluated with a strong human grounded component where they ask licensed medical professionals about the responses generated, but we unfortunately do not have the resources in this one year to gather input from physicians, so we're planning on using the MIMIC-3 dataset 
And MIMIC3 is a popular, large, de-identified patient EHR data uh, database for patients from the years 2001 to 2012. It contains uh, structured data such as lab results, hospital visits, uh, medications, et cetera, as well as unstructured discharge summaries and doctor notes. To evaluate federation, we will assess it against some existing RAG benchmarks. So ro noise robustness assesses if there are documents that are like irrelevant to the prompt, whether or not the model can correctly select for the ones that are relevant. So for example, if we're asking about the year 2019 and there are documents between like 2018, 2019, 2020, we're kind of assessing whether or not it can accurately pick out information from 2019. And then negative rejection is if the documents do not contain the answer to the prompt. We're assessing whether or not the model is able to admit that it does not know the answer rather than hallucinate something. And information integration deals with more complex user questions that involve perhaps synthesizing information across multiple documents. And traditionally, RAG models are very good with noise robustness in the sense that they're able to accurately respond as long as the noise is below 80% or another like pretty high reasonable number. Um, but they do struggle with negative rejection and information integration. So for our use case, information integration is especially of interest because the information used to respond will likely be distributed across multiple retrievers across multiple hospitals. So for security, we will do a survey of current security threat models to LLMs, such as like prompt engineering to try to get it to leak patient data and assess how our role control filters are able to prevent that kind of security leakage. And we're planning on using OAuth as our authorization system, so we kind of inherit their security guarantees as well for that. So uh, thank you to Lalana for helping us with the direction of this project. And also thank you all for listening. We are really excited for this project and we'd appreciate any questions or suggestions. You can tell you're at MIT when you, when you listen to this. Um, <laughs> we, we created a system, uh, speaking of open courseware, a very similar technically on how to ask, how to ask question to open courseware content, right? And um, I have a question about on the, on the third step. So the first step is retrieval, which is, um, which is um, there's a lot of uh, systems and you can do it with not uh, much uh, uh, expensive in terms of computation, right? There are systems you can, there are open source systems that are, are easy to run yourself uh, to do the embeddings and so on. On the generation step, we use uh, uh, obviously uh, ChatGPT API. For obvious reason, you, you probably cannot use it. But to the idea of decentralization, it seems to me that the generation part is very centralized today, which is owned by OpenAI and, 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 and Google. I'm not familiar with the model you said that you're using for generation. Is that a small model you can run in your infrastructure? And does it have to be actually a very sophisticated model? Given that you're saying, I'm giving to you some documents, you sort of, can you summarize it for me? Is at the end of the day what it's doing. Does it have to be a very complex LLM trained on this huge amount of data like ChatGPT is? So the model that we talked about, which was uh, like Flan T5, uh, and then we also talked about like GPT-2, because GPT-2 is like, it, it, I think only GPT-3.5 and above is like considered to be hosted. There's like a number of models that you can just like import them. And uh, then like, as long as you have like the library, then like it's not, if it's not, a, oh, sorry. If it's not an API call, <laughs> Thank you. If it's not an API call, then it is not being sent to like uh, like a server for processing, I assume. So I think that is okay. Uh, to answer the question about uh, like whether a really complex model is needed, um, to be honest, we're in like the pretty early stages of testing what these models can do. Um, 
we haven't been like that impressed with GPT two, to be honest. There's like definitely a diff a like difference between uh the level of like GPT three point five Chat GPT and GPT two, uh, which like tends to ramble. But I think for many years, LLMs have at least had document like summarization as like a major task that they've been trained on. So this is like an, ab an ability that they have. I think the how good that ability is differs a lot from model to model. I think Flaunt T5 in particular is like, I think shown to have pretty good performance. It's been used in like some similar work that we've seen. So we're hoping to get some better results out of this as well. Um, also, I guess these models are probably smaller than like the one behind ChatGPT, but they are all they are also like in the grants. They are also like pretty large. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I know there are a lot of models, uh, especially after Facebook open sourced their Llama model that can be run locally, but it looks like in this system all of the queries are still going through this whatever this gear is, this centralized system. Um, and then the retrieved documents are being passed to the LLM. Are you worried about the LLM leaking patient information between queries? So if you, like, is there something you do to reset the LLM after each query to make sure that like a previous cohort of retrieved documents doesn't appear in future results? Well, so I don't think that L the LLM isn't like learning when it's, um, once it's been trained and it's like answering prompts, it's not kind of learning off of past things that it's been given. Actually, like it is actually like kind of our intention if like the, the uh, idea of having these conversations with an LLM in which in which the model actually does remember both the previous user questions and its own responses to that question and the documents that it retrieved in response to those questions. Um, that's actually kind of like a separate thing that needs to be added on for that to happen. Uh, that's actually something that Langchain enables, which is what, uh, I guess why we took an interest in that. But on its own, if you just uh, invoke an LLM again and again, um, the parameters of the model are going to be the same every time. So uh, it's not going to, like the model will not change in between queries. So yeah, I mean, there's still concerns about like sending, uh, about making sure that when the data is like, retrieved and uh like it, it, at some point like there is a, a bit of like uh like bringing in data from multiple sources so i think that part is like our concern rather than like uh whether the model like remembers because i think it should shouldn't yeah so i think this is a great model for uh preserving privacy where you've sort of distributed the um the responsibility for defining these perimeters i i have a, a question which i i don't think is a huge one about kind of the infrastructure you're presuming to build in order to get that those those um privacy guarantees so what we have here is a bunch of hospitals and they are enabled they are allowed to do a search using embeddings of all of these documents there's been some fairly recent research about um extracting data from embeddings so if you imagine that you have a document and you don't have access to the document, but you do have access to the embedding because you want to do the search, then that embedding it, it might reveal, you might be able to extract data about uh, at a fairly granular level, the original document like names or, or, or things like that. It, do you think that's a, that, that's a risk that you're going to try and you, you, when you do your risk assessment that you might be building an infrastructure that will actually leak more data of these huge archives of documents even within these institutions rather than just to your, to your model? Yeah, okay, so I guess because we don't have like data from actual hospital setup right now, I can talk a little bit about how the database we're using handles this kind of thing. And I think that might be informative for what uh, would happen in practice. So Mimic3 is a very popular database for doing clinical EHR uh, research. And the way that they do de-identification is uh, I think like a good general framework. And I th uh, so what they do is some examples of what they do are um, we talked a little bit about like like perturbation of data, uh, like as like a general tactic of like differential privacy. Um, 
So some things that they do are they, they the, the date of birth, the dates of birth are like shift, the years are shifted. So like they have patients born in like the year 3000 or something. So that's like one method of de-identification. De um, they have like patient IDs, so no names, but it is obviously helpful to have the same data points for a single, like you don't want to not have any sort of idea of where the data points are coming from because they are linked in an important way. But the names are removed. Um, I think things like date of birth, date of death are like shifted. Um, there's other tactics here that I kind of like important information that they consider to be important or identifying are like scrubbed. Um, so they are like steps that they take to not like directly have like names revealed in that sense. Uh, but things like, uh, like the patient notes and, and discharge summaries and the unstructured text is mostly going to appear as is, except for like maybe keywords about the patient. Um, so I guess why I bring that up is that I think that this is like a good general thing to do when uh, like in, in like a practical system. Uh, right now we're still in like just doing with like the test data, uh, like hoping that that like real practical data resembles this database. Um, but I think things like uh, if we are not exposed, like if the embeddings for those documents are not created, are created um, after the model has been de-identified, uh, in ways like similar to this other database and uh, maybe like newer techniques since like 2016 is I think when that database was created. Um, I think there should be like minimized risk of this, but uh, yeah, it's like a really good thing to, to think about and keep in mind. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Jack Cushman from the Library Innovation Lab. Um, I've been working on, uh, and our lab has been on, on RAG models for, um, legal information retrieval. And so this is very exciting to see. And I love the model of uh, privacy preserving agents and a distributed system who can pass along the things that you need to see to, to do information retrieval. I think that's really neat. Uh, what I've observed in the legal field is that so far our field is not thinking enough about the first arrow on your slide, which is the conversation between the, the doctor and the uh, coordinating system. Uh, we're still thinking in terms of you put in text, you get out text that answers your question or doesn't, uh, but for legal uses, they're not sharing nearly enough about here's how I answered it and how you can interpret what I have so that you know whether this is a good answer or not. Uh, and so that's where our focus is going is on building um, like benchmarks for human computer interaction researchers to test whether this interface is getting done what it needs to get done. Uh, so since you asked for advice, my advice is that first arrow, don't underthink that one either. I, I really like the rest of what you're doing, um, but I would say it's very easy to get to the end and say, I gave you an answer and because I left out some key context about how I got there, you were still at ground, uh, you know, step one in terms of actually feeling comfortable treating your patient. Uh, and that's been our, our experience in a different field, so I hope it's useful in yours as well. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. I am Irene Tennyson, and I'm a PhD student at the Decentralized Information Group. So I'll be talking about uh, machine learning and like um, more about like uh, collaborative machine learning in microcontrollers. So we are moving away from large language models to microcontrollers. Um, that was a bit of a context. So jumping right in. Oh, this doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, we are surrounded by IoT devices from smartwatches and smart light bulbs to smart grids and intelligent transport systems. We are surrounded like by many, many, many IoT devices. As per a survey by IHS, uh, there will be about 125 billion active IoT devices by 2030. That's, that's definitely a lot. But what's more important is the amount of data that all these devices would be making available to us. So yeah, it's, it's abundant. But the real question is, can we utilize this data? Um, not in its um, real form, because the data that has been generated or collected at these edge devices tend to be very sensitive. And collecting them at a server or a cloud to run some of these traditional machine learning or deep learning models is not the right way to go. So how can we go forward? One of the way is uh, on-device training. So we have 
many, we have multiple devices and we have data at those devices. We have to train models in such a way that the data do not leave these devices. So through on-device training, we'll be able to run machine learning models at the device without sharing the data to the cloud or the server. But is it really easy? Well, it's very complicated. Um, the current deep learning models run on GPUs, which are obviously not power constrained or memory constrained. Um, yeah, that's the current world. We can also make some modifications to these algorithms to run them on mobile devices, which are like um, around 4 GB memory, a bit of constraints, but yes, it is possible. But the devices that we are looking at are microcontrollers. Those are like 100,000 times smaller than the GPUs or and at least 16,000 times smaller than the mobile devices in which some of the machine learning models run. So it's a very complicated task to run all these existing deep learning on microcontrollers. But um, we've seen some light in the last few months. Uh, two papers were published. The first one is the on-device training under 256 KB memory. It was published from MIT. And they used methods like sparse update and quantization um, to run machine learning on um, microcontrollers. Um, they basically do not update the whole model, but limit the model updation to like parts of it. So, you know, some backpropagation is saved and some memory is saved, and basically they were able to run it. And the second paper was Poet. It was from UC Berkeley, and they, or they were focusing on the storage part of the models. So they were using paging, paging and other methods to like, you know, store the weights in a weights or activations in a way that it does not affect the memory. But is that really enough? We can train, um, we can train on microcontrollers, but is that really enough? Well, again, we've got another problem. If we skew in or I mean, sorry, if we zoom in to these IoT devices, we can see that the data that is generated or collected at these devices are very dependent on the environment in which the device is. So that makes the data heavily skewed. And when we train a model on the skewed data, the models tend to be heavily biased. And these models cannot be generalized. It may not be even able to like respond to a situation that it has never seen before. So we need a model that is generalizable. Um, that's where federated learning comes in. So federated learning is a way of training um, a model without having direct access to the data. So um, to like rephrase that, we have multiple devices which would have access to their own data, but we are gonna train a model without uh, having direct access to the data, but in a collaborative way where all the devices share their parameters. Um, it's, it's a bit complicated, but let's, let's go into the next slide. This might give you a better idea. So we have multiple devices, which are microcontrollers in our case. There is a server, and these microcontrollers would have access to the data. The servers do not have access to the data at all. So initially, the server would have a model, which can be a pre-trained model or a randomly initialized model, but some model. And the server randomly selects some devices and sends over this model to these devices. Now, the devices, um, trains their own version of the model with their own data, which is obviously different at different devices. And then they send back these trained models back to the server where they are securely aggregated. And now this securely aggregated model is again sent, sent to random clients and this process continues until convergence. So on convergence, we'll have a model collaboratively trained by all these devices, but without having direct access to the data. And that leads us to TinyFL, which is the project uh, we are working on. We are trying to run this federated learning on microcontrollers that will be used in IoT networks and other edge devices. So our goal is to effectively utilize the abundance of data across billions of edge devices spread around the world to collaboratively train a machine learning model all while preserving data privacy. That is, that's obviously a lot. But in short, uh, we are trying to run federated learning and train machine learning models on IoT devices so that we'll be handling data privacy issues. Yeah. And how are we planning to do that? So our first goal is to run federated learning on microcontrollers, like I just said. And the microcontrollers are heavily memory and power constrained. So, and to run federated learning on microcontrollers, we need these microcontrollers to be able to train on device. Yeah, sorry. So 
Um, and to make these models, or sorry, to make these microcontrollers um, train models in itself or on device, we have to make a lot of a uh, lot of changes to their existing algorithms. Some of these changes include quantization, model pruning, uh, sparse updates. There are a bunch, but we need to find an effective combination of all of these to get things up and running on microcontrollers. We also have to make sure that all the devices in the network are aligned. So we've made a bunch of changes to the algorithms. We have to make sure that all these models do not diverge too much so that on securely aggregating them, they do not get corrupted. So that's one of the most important challenge that we'll be facing. And finally, we'll have to handle all the, uh, all the problems of federated learning in general, like handling stragglers. Stragglers are those devices that fail to respond at some point or like get switched off at some point. And whatever, for whatever reason, they, are fail they, are, they fail to communicate. We'll also have to handle data heterogeneity and model heterogeneity, which is the situation where the data across devices are like heavily um, skewed and they're extremely different. And model heterogeneity is the case where the models across devices are very different. We'll also have to handle communication bottleneck or bandwidth issues where the uh, microcontrollers are not able to send over the complete model or some other issues related to bandwidth. So there are a bunch of issues that we have to handle to get this project up and running in the real world. And uh, this has got, the project has got multiple applications from, uh, from closer patient monitoring and diagnosis to personalized devices and fault detection and automation and a rectification of those errors in automation and manuf manufacturing units. We have a bunch of applications for this project. And through this project, we'll be able to utilize data that's currently existing on the edge that, is, that will be accessible through IoT networks, but is currently untapped. So that is the goal of our project. And yep, thank you. And, um, questions, anyone? Questions? <laughs> I figured Danny would have something. I did wait. Um, so if this is great. I think one of the driving purposes of this is to have privacy preserving um, uh, but, but powerful decentralized models. Um, you mentioned about secure aggregation and it feels like that's the potential weak point, right? That you collect all of this data, you aggregate it, but somehow that private data, the, 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 the data that you're trying to protect ends up being integrated into the model. Can you talk a little bit about the, your thinking about how that secure aggregation can be, yeah, can sure. be guaranteed? Um, yeah. Um, so first of all, secure aggregate, okay, before going there, we are not aggregating data at all. So there are devices which would have access to the data and the devices would train the models on their own data and send back the mo model to the server, not the data. So the data resides on the devices and there is absolutely no sending, no sharing of data in any sort. But at secure aggregation, we're aggregating the model parameters. Uh, basically we have, let's say, hundreds and thousands of um, models from individual devices and we are supposed to securely aggregate them. And the security comes from the federated learning aspect of it. And one way to do it is encryption of models and then secure, securely aggregating them. There are multiple ways of doing it. There is a way where they're inserting noise and then um, they are making sure the noise across all the devices in the network sums up to zero so that they're basically averaging, but then individual model weights are noised that they do not reveal any information. So there are multiple ways in which secure aggregation comes up and yeah, I guess I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sort of as a follow-up to Danny's question, are you at all worried about whether the the difference in the models that go into a device and, and come back out can potentially leak information about what data was actually on the device and, and being trained? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, again, that's again a really important problem in the federated learning setting. Uh, the models at different devices could be very heterogeneous and they could be very different from each other. So aggregating them is 
itself a huge problem and we are working on it. And after aggregating, it's a secure aggregation process. It's supposed to be very secure so that the model that comes out of it is very likely, very unlikely to leak information from the data on which a different model was trained on. So there are two levels of um, security happening. So the, um, the chances of memory leakage is supposed to be very low. Um, does that, did that answer? <laughs> Thank you. So I only have a, like a little bit of experience with training uh, AI models, but um, you know, like when you're working with uh, something like stable diffusion, you work with a series of checkpoints. So you train against a previous checkpoint. Is there any kind of system for sending models back to these microcontrollers so that they can work with some sort of checkpoint system and improve on themselves? Um, that's a Good question. So if you look at this process, the second step, in the second step, uh, the microcontrollers train themselves. They do not converge, they train themselves for like, let's say n number of steps. And then there's an aggregation which updates the model at the server and this process continues. So, and I mean, before, I mean, yeah, it does continue, but the server then sends out this aggregated model back to the clients. So there's definitely a checkpoint happening at the server. And in case one of the devices are like out or like becomes corrupt, you can always go back to this checkpoint at the server and then um, run the entire training again or like restart from wherever it left out. So there is definitely this possibility of introducing checkpoints. Um, but I'm not very familiar with the specific use case of diffusion models. Um, but I think there is definitely a way to insert these checkpoints and restart from where it left out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.